Well, this morning, uh, I wanted to share with you about the back button. You know that on your phones, it takes you back to the previous page. And I would suppose that all of us have a time, a place, an event we wish we could go back to. Whether to continue enjoying it or maybe grasp some opportunity that was there that we didn't. Or maybe to change something that went wrong. But there is no back button for life. The Bible has some here and now instruction, promises, and warnings about those back button things and how we're to deal with them. Now, I might be presumptuous, but I imagine that all of us have some of those moments that we wish we could take back. Some words, uh, maybe some actions or choices that have had ongoing results and those results involve pain and suffering even for some who were innocent. There's a promise. A promise of a redeemer. A promise that has been kept. It's been kept. The Gospels record the Messiah, Emmanuel, God with us, came and made atonement, complete atonement. If you only get one thing out of this sermon today, I want you to get that, that instead of annihilation and obliteration, God made a promise, and he was faithful to keep it. God's nature is love and mercy. He desires this more than judgment. He's provided redemption. Well, as we think about that, maybe you've traveled someplace new before where you've never been, and you missed an exit, you made a wrong turn, and that map or GPS, depending on which you have, it shows very plainly that you can't get to your destination. You need to turn around. You can't keep going that way. You won't get there. And since <clears throat> we can't back button our life and go back and change all those wrong things that were said and done, we, we need to turn from the selfish attitudes, desires, and choices that caused all that. Jesus dramatically taught this. It's found in Luke 13. There were present at that <clears throat> season some who told him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And Jesus answered and said to them, Do you suppose that these Galileans were worse sinners than all other Galileans because they suffered such things? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Or those 18 on whom the tower in Siloam fell and killed them? Do you think that they were worse sinners than all other men who dwell in Jerusalem? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Jesus taught that all need to repent. Not just those who seem to be the worse sinners. You see, it's... it's human nature for us to compare ourselves with others and go, well, I'm better than them, so I'm okay. That's how the human, we compare ourselves and think, well, because I'm better than that, I'm okay. But that's not what Jesus said. He taught that all need to repent. And Peter and Paul taught the same thing. 2 Peter 3.9 the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering towards us, not <clears throat> willing that any should perish, but that all 
should come to repentance. The Apostle Paul, in his letter to the Romans, spoke of this. It's found in chapter 2, verse 4. Or do you despise the riches of his goodness, forbearance, and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? Paul went on in chapter 3 to talk a little more about this. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth as a propitiation by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness, because in his forbearance God had passed over the sins that were previously committed to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. We all need to repent. We all need to repent. Now, even if we have repented, before God we've repented of those things that have brought hurt to others. But if it's possible for us to make amends, then we're to prioritize that. That's what Jesus taught. It's found in his Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5, verses 23 and 24. Therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go your way. First, be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your gift. You see, if... If we offend others and we are able to do something about that, we're supposed to. And if we neglect to do it, well then there's spiritual consequences for neglecting to try and make it right. There's spiritual consequences. You know, both the Old Testament and the New Testament instruct us to meditate on Scripture, study Scripture, I got a couple scriptures I want you to chew on. They're short, but they're powerful. And I want you to put them in the context of offending other people and how you respond when you know that you've offended someone. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7. Husbands, likewise dwell with them with understanding, giving honor to the wife as to the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. And then Paul in Ephesians 4, verses 26 and 27 said, Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath, nor give place to the devil. So I, I think that we can see that if we fail to do our part to avoid offending people intentionally and the necessity to reconcile with people if we have, our prayers can be hindered. We can open the door for our enemy to get a foothold against us. We need to prioritize reconciling offenses. If you're like me, I've got clumsy fingers. My wife can type really fast. She's got nimble fingers. For me to use the phone, texting, forget it. I can't. <laughs> and sometimes I'll clumsily, inadvertently bump that back button. I don't know if it's a part of my hand, a different finger, whatever. And all of a sudden it's startling and confusing because I was on this page and now I'm on that page and I don't even know how I got there. Do you know that sometimes there's triggers that can do this to us? It can instantly take us from the here and now to back there, to that time, that place, that event, with all those emotions, the anger, the anxiety, the pain, all, all of it, we're right there again. Do you know that Jesus, when he was concluding the Lord's Prayer, he warned 
about failing to forgive and the unescapable consequences. It's found in Matthew 6, 14 and 15. For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. It's necessary to forgive. And sometimes I think our enemy knows this truth better than we do. Because he wants us to feel that we have the right to stay offended. That we have a right to. And sometimes it's attitudes like this that keep us there. What those people did was wrong. We suffered, so should they. Sometimes it's attitudes like that that keep us from forgiveness. But the truth is, continuing unforgiveness only harms us. Paul's instruction about this is unmistakable. It's found in Colossians 3.13. Bearing with one another and forgiving one another, if anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you must also do. No exemptions. Jesus didn't give any exemptions. Forgiveness is a necessity. You know, Paul suffered a lot at the hands of many. He was beaten. He was stoned. He was imprisoned. He had losses of, of all kinds. And yet he had a committed response. In the middle of all that, he had a committed response, and he encourages other believers to join him in his response. It's found in Philippians. I want us to look at Philippians 3, uh, verses 12 through 17. Listen to what Paul says. Not that I have already attained, or am already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, let us, as many as are mature, have this in mind, and if in anything you think otherwise... God will reveal even this to you. Nevertheless, to the degree that we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule, let us be of the same mind. Brethren, join in following my example, and note those who so walk as you have us for a pattern. He encourages us to live the same way, to press on. The need to press on. To keep going forward in Christ. Did you notice that this instruction was to the mature? It was to the mature. Have, have you ever noticed that we don't instantly overnight receive all the graciousness of Christ so that in every, every circumstance of life that we demonstrate the love of Christ, the grace of Christ. That doesn't happen instantly to us. We, we struggle to walk in this. It takes time for those things to become a part of our new nature and a part of, of our character that we respond according to the fruit of the Spirit and not the old nature. Did you know there's things that need to be aged? Did, did you know that just this stuff, um, hot sauce, just that Tabasco sauce, did you know that all of that stuff has to be aged, if you'd put up the next one, has to be aged at least three years. Some of it eight years. Some of it more. Just so that it can have the right flavor. Now, if just Tabasco sauce needs to be aged, to have the right flavor. Do you suppose maybe it would take a little bit of time for us, and we all know our old us, 
to be walking in the new nature, the fruit of the Spirit, the graciousness of Christ, maybe that's going to take a little time. And we need to press on. We need to keep pressing on. Do you know that the scriptures, both the Old Testament and the New, they, they have examples of those that, well, they didn't continue on. In the Old Testament, there was first generation Israel that came out of Egypt. In the New Testament, in the Gospels, there were those that started to follow Christ. And as soon as things got hard, well, they turned away. Some of you might remember this humorous song, but it, it warns us about this. Humorous. <laughs> but Keith Green is trying to poke us a little bit about, do you really want to go back? Don't you know the consequences of going back? That we were delivered. We were saved. We were redeemed. We were made children of God. And the whole book of he Hebrews is written to those that were pondering leaving Christ because it was too hard. And what a book of apologetics of how superior Christ is in every way. But I want us to look at his encouragement to these. It's found in chapter 10. I want us to look at verses 35 through 39. His encouragement for them to press on. Therefore, do not cast away your confidence, which has great reward. For you have need of endurance, so that after you have done the will of God, you may receive the promise. For yet a little while, and he who is coming will come, and will not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith, but if anyone draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not of those who draw back to perdition, but of those who believe to the saving of the soul. Faith presses on to the end to the saving of the soul. I've shared all this this morning to ask you a few questions, and so maybe with heads bowed and eyes closed, maybe there's someone here this morning you recognize you need to accept Christ. You need to accept His redemption, His forgiveness. You need to be the recipient of abundant and eternal life. If that's you, and you, you recognize you need that, or if you want to know more about it, raise your hand. And, you know, Scripture tells us that the goodness of God leads us to repentance and that all need to repent. We can't go back and change things, but we certainly can repent of it. Maybe there's some, you recognize there's some things you need to repent of. Maybe even more so, you might recognize there's some things you need to prioritize about making right, that there's someone that you've offended and you need to make it right. You need to prioritize that, to do that as soon as possible. And, and Lord, you might just raise your hand and say, Lord, help me. I'll make it right. Help me. Maybe there's some that you need to forgive. The enemy has been deceiving you, telling you you have the right to continue on being offended with them thinking all this hard things against them. But you need to forgive. And you might say, Lord, I don't have the strength. I, I can't in myself. Can I encourage you and remind you that Romans chapter 5, it tells us that the Holy Spirit will pour the love of God into our hearts. God will help you. You just need to surrender in obedience to Commit yourself to do it. And we need to press on. We need to press on. We need endurance to receive the promise. God will strengthen us. He'll help us. 
So, Father, I thank you for your goodness. I thank you for the promise of redemption and the reality of redemption. Lord, I pray, help your people, Lord. Lord, to make it right with those they've offended, to forgive those who have offended them, and give them strength, Lord, to press on. I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. May God bless you and keep you.